thank you everyone for joining. It's, it's nice to see you all here. Um, today we have again a very special guest because he is. Uh, it's it's his second talk this year. His first talk was on the first of April, I think, on a prime number theorem. And um, yeah, his name is Lawrence van die Kerk, and he's the previous chairperson of SAMS. So yeah, what a what a guy. Um, <laughs> today you will be talking about uh, automata um, and. Well, you can probably see his introduction from last time, but he did his honors and in Stellenbosch, and he's currently in Germany doing his masters. So, very, very interesting and exciting. So, yes, thank you, Lawrence, for being here. Um, and yeah, you can start whenever you're ready. Perfect. Thank you for the introduction, Rocco. Great. So, um, uh, so it talks about automata. So, I'm going to break the talk up into four parts. So part one, we will focus on finite state automata, which is pretty much considered, a, I'm just gonna put an A there, pretty much considered the basic automata to start with. Next, we will do push down automata, um, which is a little bit step up. Third, we will get to Turing machines, which, um, if anyone has watched the movie The Imitation Game about Alan Turing during uh, World War II and the Enigma, you would know that uh, he played a very big role in pretty much designing the first uh, computer that existed. So uh, Turing machines are pretty essential. And then I will end off with a short description of grammars. All right, so let's start. So, First of all, we have finite state automata, which I will short as FSA uh, from here on. So before we delve into it, we need to get some building blocks to uh, be able to finally define what a finite state automata is. So first of all, we will have an alphabet, much like the English alphabet, but say we have an alphabet A, and all of the elements inside the alphabet, inside the uh, alphabet, uh, so the alphabet is just A, B, and C. Then A, B, and C are the letters in our alphabet. Um, can everyone read that? Um, I don't know if I'm writing too small, or um, can I just get an indication if it's visible to er everyone what I'm writing? It's readable to me. But yeah, everyone should say if they can't see. I think it's a bit small, Lawrence. All right, all right. I'll I'll write double line instead of single line. Perfect. Is there a way to enlarge uh, just what what's being presented? Um, I can always just write bigger because with my phone it'll be again um, okay. kind of an issue to figure it out um, with the zoom. So let me. Try that better. Yeah, thanks. All right. So I will then write double line from here on out. So we have our alphabet A, B, C, and A, B, C are each letters. <clears throat> now uh, we want to create a language from our alphabet. So uh, what a language will be. That spelling is perfect. What a language will be, it'll be a subset of a star. And what a star is, is simply all of the strings, uh, we'll say finite strings, but you could go uh, infinite strings of letters formed from uh, our alphabet A. So inside a star, we will have things like uh, the letters themselves. We can have A, 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 B. Uh, we can have a bunch of Bs and then C, A, B. All of these are words inside A star. And the language that we want to get to will be a subset of A star defined by a, um, a certain set of principles or rules. And there's two ways to define these rules or to define the language. The one way 
to define a language is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, to have the language be acceptable by a automata. So that's the main focus that we're gonna have for most of the talk. But the second way to also define a language is if it is, my spelling is going to be bad, but generatable by a grammar. All right, and uh, with that, I can now get into what an automata itself is. So, what an automata is. Laren, just move it a bit up, if you can, please. Perfect. Thank yes. you for the warning. I can uh, even move my phone down a little bit. All right. So, what an automata is, is it's going to be this machine, which we'll call M, which reads from a tape. So our tape will be, for example, this uh, semi-infinite block containing letters or symbols. Say here's an A, A, B, there can be a one. We can have a omega in there. And it goes that way and it reads from the tape. Uh, it reads the tape. It uh, possibly writes something. And <clears throat> and after reading, accepts the word or not. Right. So it reads the entire type, the entire word on the type, and then if based on the machine that we constructed, it accepts that or not, it's in our language. And so all accepted words, all accepted words uh, by M is what creates the language, the language defined by M. And M is defined over A, and the, the symbols, characters, letters on the tape are the letters of A. All right. So there's a few building blocks of what the automata is. All right. So finite state automata. As the name suggests, there are finite states. And all that it has extra is that um, it's a read-only type head. So say, for example, uh, we have two states. So you have two states here. This state is called uh, the say, theta 0. And the state here is theta one. The set of states we will denote by a sigma. So sigma is equal to that. And then <clears throat> we would have our tape here. Goes like that. And we want to have an alphabet to do our things on. So say our alphabet is just zero and one. So you have our alphabet zero and one. So this tape will consist of zeros and ones. And let's think what we want to make from this tape. So one example is where we have 
M accepts uh, all words uh, with even amount of ones. All right. So we want to create a finite set automata which uh, works like this and accepts all words with even amount of ones. So we, first of all, we need to decide which state we start in. So we indicate that like this, with this filled in error. So this is our starting state. We have this tape here. Say our tape goes like 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. And let's say it ends there. So it's just these seven. You can see there's four one, so we should end up in a accepting state. And we shall make the accepting state this, which we indicate by a circle. There can be more than one accepting states. In this case, there's just one accepting state. All right. So if we, we, we can either read a zero or one in the first place. So we're starting from here. And every time we read something and we change state, we move our head of, our, our head is right now here. We move our head one to the right. So if we read a zero, there is still an, sorry, there's a bit of noise. Um, even amount of ones. Let's just do this as well. Uh, even amount of ones greater than or equal to two. Right. Sorry, there is a noise outside. So we start here. If we read a zero, we just get back there. And if we read a one, we will go somewhere else. So. so now we have a, another state over here. We'll call that theta two. And now if we read a zero again, we're just um, <clears throat> going to stay here. So we read a zero like that. And if we read a one again, now we have two ones. So we get to our accepting state. Uh, from here, if we keep reading zeros, we still have two ones. So we will stay in our accepting state. And if we read a one now again, we would have read one, two, three. So now we have an, un, an odd amount of ones and we need to move out of this state. So we would move back there if we read a one again. All right. So now we have from this state, what happens if we have a zero or a one? At this state, if we have a zero or a one, and at this state, if we have a zero or a one. So let's try and follow this word here, zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, one. All right. So we start here in our starting state. We read a zero, so we stay in this state. Then we read a one, so we go to state theta two. We read a zero, so we stay in that state. We read a one, so we go to state theta one. We read our third one, so now there's an even amount, so we move out again to theta two. We read a zero, we stay in our state, and we read a one again, and we move back there. So we end in this state here. We end in this state here. And that state happens to be the accepting state. So this word 0101101 is in fact a word accepted by our finite state automata. So that's now one example of <clears throat> a finite state automata. Now, hopefully uh, my time management will <laughs> remain decent. Uh, I want to get some help in making another finite set automata with the help of some people. So 
I want to make an M which accepts from the alphabet, zero and one again, accepts all words ending in one. All right. So can anyone make a suggestion of um, how we would go about this? How many states, how many states would we have, for example? You can have two. Yes. So say we have two states. So yeah, two states, and uh, our starting state can't be the accepting state because we start with an empty string. We haven't read anything, so uh, we haven't read a one. So we have an accepting state there, and we have a starting state here. All right. Uh, what happens if the first thing that we read is zero? Sorry? Sorry, Say I'm again? just confusing myself. <laughs> so, uh, Dylan, go ahead. What, what do you think? Oh, I, I mean, if you have a zero, you stay in this starting state, I assume. But then the complication is what if you have a one? I don't know if you should just. Hmm. So, yeah. if, if you have a one, then the last thing that you read was a one. So, you do move to the accepting state. All right, so now what happens if the next thing that you read was a zero after reading the one? Go back to the starting state. So we read zero. And if we read a one again? Uh, you stay there. Exactly. So that's that's the um, machine <laughs> uh, in this diagram. And so if we have word zero one one zero one one uh, one zero one, you can see that it ends in one. And so it would uh, ta -da, ju jump about here and then end up in our accepting state. And that word would be accepted by um, M and so it is an element of the language of M, for example. All right. Now uh, I do need to define what deterministic and non-deterministic is. So uh, I will show this by an example. Let me just check here that I draw this right. One here, zero. Yeah, sorry, I wrote that at the wrong spot. All right, so the machine that I made here is M accepts all words with a substring zero one zero um, <clears throat> or one zero one. So you can see uh, if you have zero, one, zero, and then you can get anything after that, it stays in the accepting state or one, zero, one. But you'll notice that from our start state, that 
we have two arrows with a one on it and two arrows with a zero on it. And in fact, here, you don't even have a zero. You don't even have a one from this state. So what determinis uh, determinism is in uh, automata is if from any state you have maximum, you can have zero, but you have maximum one transition from a state by a certain letter. So this automata here would be non-deterministic, but it's a finite state automata still, because if we were to take the word, I don't know, one, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, you see that here, there's a zero, one, zero. Now, let us just move it down again, please. Ah, thank you. I um, can't really see my phone's thing on my laptop, so just shout every time that I, I need to move down. Thanks. So you can see with this one cycle here and this zero, we might as well just jump here the whole time and stay in this single state here. But with non-deterministic automata, and in this case, finite state automata, if there is at least one path to follow from our input string, which ends up in an accepting state, then the word is accepted. So uh, that one might not be, but we can go one, one, zero, and then zero, one, zero, and then one, zero. That path does end up there, so this word does get accepted. Um, I will denote non-deterministic finite state automata as NDFSA. And interesting thing about non-determinism non and determinism, and this is actually a theorem, maybe I should write bigger, is that um, all NDFA, NDFSA can be turned into a DFSA, a, a deterministic finite state automata. We'll see that this is also the case for uh, determinism when we get to push down automata and when we get to Turing machines. And the way we would do this uh, is as follows. Usually when we try and do this, uh, because it's, all, it's always possible, but most of the time when it happens, we would need to implore many more states. Here we have six states, um, but fortunately enough with this example, we could still remain at six states. So I'll just try and draw it here. Our accepting state is still there, and our starting state is still over here. You can move, move a bit up again, Lawrence, please. Thanks. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Great. So say we read a zero. That's the uh, one third of the way towards one of the substrings we want. And say we read a one first. That's also a third of the way to this one. All right. If we now read a zero again from this state, we remain there because the next two might still be one or a zero, that one and then a zero. So we can stay here if we read a zero. If we read a one, we're now two thirds towards the accepting state. Um, similarly down here. So if we read a one again, and if we read a zero there. All right. If we're now in this state and we read a zero, then we had a zero, one, zero. So we do end up here. And if we had a zero or a bunch of zeros and then a one and a one again, now, unfortunately, we can't, uh, we're not two thirds of the way anymore, but our last uh, input letter was still a one, which still gets us a third of the way. So we would go 
there. Right. And here it follows pretty much similarly. So if we read a one there, and if we read a zero, we would go over there. And now, if we've gotten to the accepting state, then uh, we already have a substring. So uh, any zeros or ones that follow just keeps us there. So that's the non-deterministic one. And this is the deterministic finite set. It's on the range. All right. Last thing that I will mention, and this is just for uh, so I feel better about the completeness, is any language which is um, uh, generated by a finite state atomata. Um, maybe then, let me write it big here. Languages accepted by FSA are regular. How do you spell regular like that? Right. Perfect. And that pretty much concludes final state automata. Right. Uh, is switch up my notes. All right. Uh, Rocco, is the top visible here? M move a bit down. Yeah, but uh, uh, more. Okay, now the top is visible for me. Okay. All right. So now we move on to push down automata, which I will refer to as PDA. All right. So we'll find us our automata with finite states, and we just had this input tape, which we only read from. Now we've pushed on automata. We're still just going to have this semi infinite type, which can go there, and we have a bunch of letters inside of it 0, 1, A, 1, omega, all of that. But in addition to what we had previously, and still with finite states, is that we now have a semi infinite stack here. So we're going to have this space on the side where we can, after reading, after reading our, from our input tape, we have the option to put something on the stack. So the stack could be something completely different. If our tape language, uh, sorry, not language, tape alphabet is say A and B, our stack alphabet can be completely separate, or it can contain it, but it can be X, for example. So we can have we can have a bunch of X's over here, and the the way the operation is going to work for the PDA compared to FSA is as follows: We're first going to <clears throat> We're going to read the tape. We're going to uh, take from top of stack. And we're going to um, <clears throat> check our state. Uh, check the state. Then we will change state. And uh, possibly add to stack. Now, what we add to stack doesn't just have to be one letter. It can be a string. And the way we would add the string, so say, for example, if we were to add the string, um, if we wanted to add the string ABC, 
we would add it from the bottom up. So we would add it A, B, C. Right. So that's how the operation works for the PDA. So let's try and show this in a nice example. So first, let's think we have a machine. There's an example. We have a machine accepting um, words of A and B and and greater equal to one. So all the words where there's a the same amount of A's and B's and all the B's are after the A's. And uh, there's at least one A and at least one B. So the way we would, we would conceptualize it is we have, we have an A here and we have our stack. So we, we read an A and we add an A to, we add a, let, let's not say an A, let's, let's add an X to the stack. We read another A and we add another X to the stack. So now there's two. And then when we start reading a B, we would remove the top one from the stack. And if we read another one, we would remove that one from the stack as well. And we would see that the stack ends up empty and, and or maybe we end up in a accepting state and so AABB is accepted by this machine. The way this would look with a nice diagram is as follows. So say for example, we start over here. So let's just uh, formalize here. A is our, our alphabet, our tape alphabet is A and B. And we're going to make our stack alphabet be, let's say, X and Z. I'll explain that in a second. Before we start, we can, when uh, starting our uh, machine, we can have already uh, some blocks on our stack. So to this end, we're going to have, which is the only reason that Z exists, I'll move up, is to have something which marks the bottom of the stack. Right, so we start here. Uh, one more thing that I need to mention is, if we read something or uh, we, we read something and have the top of stack and have the state in such a way that no action is possible. So for example, we, we read an A and then a B and then an A again, then automatically the automata just ends and it's not accepted. So starting here, what we would see is we would read an A from our type. We would take the Z from the stack, and what we would write to the stack is A Z, because we're replacing the Z again to hold the bottom of the stack, and we're putting another A on top. Right, and then we get to a new state. And from here, we can continue reading more A's. So here would be if we read another A, now there's going to be, be already an A in the stack, so we remove this A from the stack. But now we've read two A's, so we want to have we want to replace this A that we took off and put another A there again. So now the stack is getting bigger. Stop. We take one off and we add two back. So it's fine. If we now finally read a B. We move to a new state. So we read a B, we take an A from the stack, and to indicate that we're not writing anything back to the stack, uh, we use the symbol epsilon. Epsilon you can think of as a empty. 
So read a B and we take an A off the stack. And we want to continue doing this until all the A's are off the stack. So that procedure stays the same. And then finally, when we've finished reading the tape and um, <clears throat> if we finished reading the tape and there's still something on the stack, that means that we read less B's than A's. And as I just explained, then the automata can just stop and it's not accepted. But if we do read from the, from the tape, nothing because we, we finished it and all that is left on the stack is Z and we don't write anything to the stack because there's no need, then we do end up in an accepting state. So say for example, we have A, 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 B, B, B. Our first A moves us to this state and then we stay in this state twice and we add from this transition and these two, we have three A's in the stack. We read our first B and we remove an A from the stack and we don't add anything back with the epsilon. We stay in this state twice as well, reading two more B's, removing an A twice, adding nothing back. And then there's nothing more left in our tape. So all that we read is nothing. All that is left on the stack is dead. We don't need to add anything back and we end up in an accepting state. And this word is in fact accepted by the machine. Does everyone follow? Rocco? Yes, I think so, Lawrence. It reminds me of, of um, what we did in computer science last year um, with just stacks and, and queues and stuff like that. Um, mm. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's pretty much the gist of it. I will just briefly mention though that with push on automata, you get a couple of variations of it. So I pretty much gave the definition up here with uh, the process, but you get different types. So the type which we have been looking at are called final, uh, final state automata, as we did it in uh, the FSA as well, where you want to end somewhere like there. You can also define a push down automata as an empty stack automata. So in this case, you, you won't have any accepting states, but if you read the entire tape and you reach where you don't read anything anymore, and the last thing on the stack is this placeholder at the bottom, then from that you move to an accepting state. So for example, you'd have, you'd have something here, you'd have something here, and everything you're doing is just jumping in between these two or staying in the same and the stack is going up and down and only once you're reading nothing anymore and it's top of stack do you move to a state and then um, the stack would be empty and this would be the accepting state for example or from there but only if the stack is empty and then uh, peculiarly a special form of the empty stack automata would be the single state automata. Now I mentioned that your alphabet uh, for the stack and for the tape can be anything. So in this case, it can even be tuples in a way, or uh, you should see the tuples more as symbols. So for example, we're just staying in this in this one state over here, and uh, we're just moving into it the whole time. But depending on what we're reading from the tape, what we're adding on the stack would be some would look something like this. 
So uh, there's an X, and there's another state, and, um, and there's the in-between state, and say there's like a P0 here, and there's a third state here. This thing here, you can look of as a symbol, and that's what you're adding to the stack or removing depending on what you're reading. And so you're just staying here the whole time. And once your input tape runs out, then the stack should be empty of these strange things. And then you uh, accept the word. So very peculiar way to think of it. It usually gets quite complicated uh, with the single state, but it's always possible. Um, oh, one more thing. I mentioned that uh, all finite set automata uh, all, all languages accepted by finite state automata are called regular. In the case of push line automata, they are called context-free. So all languages accepted by push line automata are called context-free languages. Right. a little bit of time. Now we get to Turing machines, which I will show as TM. I just need to move my notes. All right, given an, an example with, with the Turing machines would be a little bit difficult, but, uh, and there's again, many variations to define it, but the basic, model which I will explain is where we have a tape which is no longer semi-infinite just one direction it's infinite it's it's by infinite so it's infinite in both directions and our input tape starts somewhere so say our our header of the tape starts here our input word, say we could have uh, A, B, C, B, A, and that's our input word. And everything around the input word would just make an X infinitely in both directions. And the process for the Turing machines will be the following. So, oh, and then we have uh, our states. So, Sigma is our set of states. And perfect. All right. <clears throat> so uh, first thing we do is uh, we read what is at the head. So we read A. We check the state that we're in. <clears throat> Based on what's at the head and the state that we're in, we change state accordingly. We, um, uh, maybe, oh, well, yeah, we just write symbol to head. It could be the same symbol, so we could uh, erase the A and then write A again. Or we can write an X or a C, but uh, we write a symbol to the head. <clears throat> and then um, uh, we move head um, left, right, or not. So it can remain stagnant, move left or move right. And even though this looks quite simple and we don't even have a stack with this to put values on, surprisingly, the Turing machine actually is stronger than the pushed on automata by that. At least it surprises me. And uh, the function of the stack is uh, filled in with this writing ability on top of the tape itself. And then you move through it and you read it. And if, again, you 
end up somewhere in this reading process that uh, you get a combination of a state and a, what's at the header which doesn't work, then uh, you just stop right there. But otherwise, you also have your bunch of states. You have your say theta one, and you have your starting state b theta one, and you have a state here. Maybe you have a couple of states. You have like four states, and um, again, what you want to end, uh, get to is your accepting state later on. So maybe you have things going like this, and uh, ones that go on itself. And again, after you, you read all of this, you want to end up here. So typically what might happen is you might read through everything, move left and right, and then maybe, for example, with this, you would end up over here. You'd, you'd read in X, and you'd be in the accepting state, and then that's where you stop, because that's what the that's what the program tells you, and then you happen to be in an accepting state, and you're done, and the word that you read is in fact accepted. And with the Turing machines, actually, they're designed to give output as well. So for example, if you have a, a TM, and the purpose of this TM is uh, take string, Uh, of zeros and ones and write any substring of ones doubled. So maybe it reads a uh, one one zero one zero zero one one one. Then the Turing machine can output this as one 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 zero one one zero zero one 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 one. So you have your input, and you could get some output. Right. And the Turing machine is, uh, by Church's thesis, considered, let me get my just wording right. Where was I? Church's thesis. The most general model of computability uh, is what Church said. And interestingly enough, this, this uh, thesis, let me actually write it down while I'm talking. This thesis, it's uh, too vague to prove or disprove. So what is my exact wording? Most general model. Yeah. Most general model of computability. So you you'd read this and you think, what? What does general even mean? And what does computability even mean? How, how can you even compare the machines in some extent besides uh, um, ordering them by containment in that uh, all PDA are Turing machines or other way around? No, not other way around. Sorry, I'm just babbling right now. But um, it, it, it's too vague to prove it as prove or anything like that. And I won't get into that, but um, yeah, I think that's kind of interesting. Church's thesis, right? And uh, then I want to define what Turing completeness is, uh, because uh, in computer science you might have heard of Turing completeness quite often. So, what? I'll do this in green. What? Turing completeness is to a programming language or to uh, some set of rules or to a, a automata, a cellular automaton to be exact. 
is a <clears throat> yeah. There's the word. Simulate all T M. So any alphabet that you have and any amount of uh, er, any rules which are placed on the states that you have up here. Any alphabet, any states, and any rules regarding where the states and what you read, movement and all that, that the programming language can simulate all of those. So Java, of course, and C++ and uh, Python, all of them are Turing complete. And I thought I'd mention, I won't say it out, but um, there is a programming language called this, which I won't say the name, but you can read it yourself. I did not think of the name. There's a programming language called this, and all the characters which you can input are plus, minus, open bracket, close bracket, smaller than, bigger than, uh, full stop and uh, comma. The programming language consists of only these eight characters and uh, by the definitions associated to the characters, this programming language is also Turing complete. So uh, something as simple as hello world, which on Python you just say print hello world and it prints it, for this, you would get this long list of symbols which no human can understand possibly. And um, it's like it's like a hundred symbols, I think, maybe more to print Hello World with this, but this language can is turn complete and can do anything that Java can do, given enough symbols and uh, processing time. It can do that as well. And then I still have five minutes. So the thing I wanted to end on is grammars, because I mentioned earlier that uh, we can define languages either by an automata accepting it or by a grammar generating it. Our grammars. And there are three sets which we need to be able to do grammars. So we have a set V, which is our variables set. We have a set T, which will be our terminals set. I will explain in a moment. And we have our set P, which is our production rules set. So to explain this, I'll, I'll take the example again, or uh, a close example to what I had previously of uh, A to the power N, B to the power N, is we have, say, A to the power N, we have B to the power n plus m, and then uh, c to r m, and we have that n and m are elements of uh, uh, the natural numbers. Right. So our variables are going to be a, b, and c. Uh, I think I'll show via the production rules what the terminals will be. So we'll start with an S. Just hear me out. We'll start with an S. And this S produces to a U and a V. Now, what does the U produce to? The U can produce to a A u, b, or it can produce to nothing. 
and the v can produce to a b v c or nothing so our set of terminals are going to be s u and v and our production rule set is going to be each of these so this this here this here is one element and uh, that's an element and that's an element of the production rule set and uh, then the way it works is anytime that you have a u you need to produce it out until when all the terminals are done you only have variables and the variables that you have uh, decide what the language uh, what the words in the language are so say we have we have an s this s goes to u and v then we first do the u so the this u would go to a a u b v and we can do that again we have a then this u goes to a u b we have a b and we have a v and then we can do the V, so we have A, A, U, B, B, and uh, this V becomes B, V, C. And then this U we can make empty, so the U just disappears. And with the V as well, we can make the V empty. So A, A, B, 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 C. And this is the same as A2, B3, C, which uh, by the language that we want uh, is an element of. Right. Uh, I hope that makes sense with it. Uh, and the same way that we went about with regular uh, languages, where regular languages are the languages made by finite zeratometer. In this case, regular, I'm getting tongue tied, regular languages are the ones which are uh, accepted by or are generated by regular grammars and uh, context free languages are, are the one generated by context free grammars. And I forgot with the Turing machines. Uh, I'll just say here in red, uh, languages uh, accepted by TM are called recursively Enumerable. So this also applies towards uh, what I was saying about grammars is that recursively enumerable languages are the ones generated by recursively enumerable grammars. And uh, because of the lack of time, I won't get into the separate definitions of what exactly a, a regular grammar is because th there's additional rules to them and the rules to context-free grammars and the rules to recursively enumerable grammars but um, I just thought it would be nice to show a little bit of how the grammars work as well and that is it I am uh, done <laughs>